In a sea of nutritional gurus, theories and conflicting opinions, have you, ever won have you ever wondered what should I eat to optimize my blood glucose, weight and health to, to feel great and thrive? If your answer is yes, you're in luck. Today, I'm excited to give you a, a look under the hood of the Nutrient Optimizer, a new tool that can help you identify optimal foods to incorporate into your diet to achieve your goals. My name is Marty Kendall, and my journey into nutrition started 15 years ago. When this happened, we started to think about having these. <laughs> my wife Monica has type 1 diabetes, and not too long after we got married, we started thinking about how we could optimise her blood glucose control to minimise the risks associated with a diabetic pregnancy. Personally, I've got a family history of my own struggles with pre-diabetes and obesity, by day, I'm an engineer, and I like to use data to optimise things quantitatively. And as they say, necessity is the mother of invention. I got frustrated with the lack of good information out there for people with diabetes and decided to take matters into my own hands to create the optimal nutritional solution for my family. You may have noticed there's a lot of argument out there about diet. Paleo, vegan, low-carb, fruititarian, ketogenic, the list goes on and on. I think, in essence, what we need is nutrients with enough energy that won't overdrive our hormones. So after experimenting with a range of parameters to optimise nutrition, the three parameters that I found to be the most useful are insulin load, nutrient density and energy density. While not as useful by themselves, we can apply different weightings to each of these parameters to optimise our food choices to suit the goals of different people. So first, let me give you an overview of the insulin load. Someone with diabetes is on a constant roller coaster of treating blood sugars with insulin. You eat, your blood sugars go up. You dose with insulin and eventually your blood sugars come down. And then you find they've dropped too low, so you have to eat something to raise them again. Uh, and you're constantly on a roller coaster. Maybe you've eaten a glucose tablet or something sugary and sweet that you probably wouldn't have otherwise eaten. This cycle continues day and night. The blood sugar insulin roller coaster leaves you feeling fatigued, hangry, and often gaining weight due to the fat storage properties of excess insulin. When the, food in, when the inputs of food and insulin are both really large, it's impossible to match the right amount of insulin to the food we eat. There's always a massive error, and the blood sugar swings are like a bad theme park ride. So logically, the goal for someone wanting to manage the blood sugars is to reduce the dietary inputs that require insulin. But then the next question is, what exactly is it in our food that raises blood glucose and requires insulin? And then how can we accurately quantify it so we can more, act more actively manage it? A couple of years back, I stumbled across a mother load of food insulin index data from a University of Sydney thesis that I thought might hold some clues about how we could more accurately manage insulin. I exported the data into a spreadsheet and started tinkering with it to better understand the relationship between the food we eat, our glucose response, and the insulin we require. It's not going to be a surprise to this audience to see that our glucose response to food is fairly closely related to the carbohydrate we eat. But things get more interesting when we look at the insulin response to the food we eat. What we see is that high-fat foods, such as bacon and avocado down here, have a fairly small insulin response while high-protein foods such as fish and steak have, still have a significant insulin response, even though they don't contain a lot of carbohydrate. Higher-fat foods over here tend to have a small insulin response, where low-fat foods, which are typically processed carbohydrates, have a large insulin response. And then, although protein requires some insulin to help us build and repair our muscles and organs, which is really, really important, Higher protein foods tend to have a lower overall insulin response because they force out refined carbohydrates from our diet. So after some playing around with the food insulin index, I found that we can more accurately predict our insulin response to food by also, in addition to carbohydrates, considering the indigestible fibre and protein, which requires about half as much insulin as carbohydrate. With this improved understanding, we can then develop these formulas to calculate the insulin load and percentage of insulogenic calories. Understanding insulin load helps us more accurately calculate the insulin people need to inject, including for protein, 
Or conversely, it can help them manage their, make better food choices so their pancreas can keep up and maintain normal blood sugars. Then the proportion of insulogenic calories allows us to identify the most ketogenic foods that will elicit the smallest insulin response in our pancreas. Understanding the percentage insulogenic calories can be really useful for people who require therapeutic ketosis to help with the management of cancer, epilepsy, Alzheimer's or dementia. So then, with better food choices that require smaller inputs of insulin, we're able to smooth out that blood sugar roller coaster. This is a really big deal for people with type 1 diabetes. However, I think the same principles apply for everybody who's somewhere on that spectrum of metabolic disease. I think our first priority should be to normalise blood sugars and insulin swings. Often then, satiety follows naturally and weight loss occurs as we're able to more, ac more easily access our own body fat and not driven by the swings in glucose and insulin to eat. However, after looking at the foods that elicit the smallest insulin response, I quickly realised that we may have another problem. The least insulogenic foods tend to be mainly fat. And while an unnecessary fear of fat has driven the unfortunate low-fat processed food saga that's been in place for most of my lifetime, I think we also need to acknowledge that the highest fat foods typically do not contain a lot of vitamins and minerals. This chart shows the nutrients contained in the fattiest foods as a percentage of the recommended daily intake for each of those nutrients. It's then been sorted to identify which nutrients we're not getting in adequate quantities up the top here. But then rather than sorting by percentage of fat, this chart shows the nutrients contained in the most ketogenic foods. While these foods are an improvement on the fattiest foods, they still don't contain the recommended daily intake for about a third of our essential nutrients. So the next question is, what can we do to maintain both low insulin levels but also get the micronutrients we need? So, enter nutrient density. Building on the work of the likes of Dr. Matt Lalonde and Joel Furman, I developed the Nutrient Density Index to identify foods that contain more of the nutrients that are harder to find. Rather than prioritising all nutrients, I think we really only need to worry about boosting the nutrients that we're currently not getting enough of. The Nutrient Density Index only, contain, only considers the essential nutrients that have agreed targets. While there are a number of other nutritional parameters that are nice to have, they tend to come along for the ride when we focus on getting the essential nutrients we need from whole food. Unfortunately, we only have data for the nutrients that are actually in a food. I hope one day we'll be able to also account for your digestion, the effect of anti-nutrients, and bioavailability of nutrients from different food sources. So then, going back to the most ketogenic foods, once we emphasise the harder to find nutrients, shown in red, we get an overall boost in the, the micronutrients across the board. The nutrient score that you see on each of these charts um, enables us to quantitatively compare the nutrient density of each of these approaches. I think ideally we want to meet at least 100% of the recommended daily intake, which is shown here, for each of the essential nutrients. Um, but if we're getting more than twice, it's, it's probably a bit of waste of time and we need to start focusing on the nutrients we're not getting enough of. So basically this score would be 100% if we filled that entire uh, red rectangle. And as you go forward, we'll see the, the, the nutrient scoring increasing. So then if we tweak the weightings and put less emphasis on insulin load and more on nutrient density, we get a more nutritious group of low-carb foods. As you can see, um, we boost the nutrient score here from 64% to 91%. And the foods that are contained in, you know, that are associated with these micronutrients are shown over here. I could go on and on about the importance of each nutrient, that I f but what I find really interesting when I analyse the micronutrient content of people following a low carbohydrate diet is that it's often the alkalising electrolytes such as potassium, magnesium and zinc that are missing on a reduced carbohydrate diet. There's been a lot of talk about salt lately, however it seems that it's these other micronutrients that are also hard to get in sufficient quantities in our diet. Dr James DeNicola Antonio references this study in his recent book The Salt Fix that shows that low sodium diets tend to lead to insulin resistance. The kidney calls on the pancreas to secrete more insulin to help them hold on to sodium when there isn't much coming from our diet. But then Volick and Finney point out that the fundamental problem with a low-salt diet 
is that it causes a loss of potassium, which is critical for building and maintaining muscle. Managing sodium and potassium is a massive deal for our body. With 40% of the energy, of the body's energy and 70% of the brain's energy devoted to managing the potassium sodium pump, which is fundamental to our energy production. It seems that as well as the sodium, the body upregulates basal insulin to hold on to other electrolytes such as potassium and calcium. Paul Jaminet points out that the Paleolithic diet was naturally high in potassium and low in sodium. Salt was rare and highly valued, so we evolved mechanisms for protecting against the threat of low sodium levels. However, because potassium was plentiful back then, we've not developed similar evolutionary mechanisms to protect us against low potassium levels, even though they're every bit as devastating to our health. Today, potassium tends to be hard to obtain from our diet and even from supplements, so we need to pay particular attention to make sure we get enough of it. Ironically though, a low carbohydrate diet that minimises total carbohydrates in, a, in an effort to reduce the bolus insulin required for our food may actually lead to a reduction in electrolytes that drives insulin resistance through an upregulation of basal insulin to enable us to, our kidneys to hold on to precious electrolytes if we're not getting sufficient quantities from our diet. And I want to move on to energy density, the third component of the nutrient optimizer algorithm. So once you've normalized your insulin and blood sugar levels to that of a metabolically healthy person, there's probably not much use in doubling down on more dietary fat if your primary goal is to lose body fat. If your goal is further weight loss, I believe the ideal approach is to maximize the nutritional content of your diet so you can minimize energy intake without risking nutrient cravings. Foods with a lower energy density tend to be more filling and allow you to reduce your energy intake naturally, which will in turn allow your body fat to be used for fuel. These weight loss foods prioritise low energy density while also prioritising nutrient density and a low insulin load and will help you lose weight if your blood sugars are still a little elevated. Meanwhile, these foods just prioritise a low energy density and high nutrient density and hence provide a lot of nutrition without too much energy. A protein sparing modified fast is often used in weight loss clinics to maximise the rate of fat loss while ensuring you're getting adequate protein intake to maintain your lean muscle mass. Adding nutrient density to this protocol will further improve your chances of success by avoiding cravings and nutrient deficiencies while still maintaining an, an aggressive energy deficit over the long term. What I find really interesting here is that even though we're not prioritising any of the amino acids, um, we're still getting tonnes and tonnes of protein. It seems that when we focus on the harder to find nutrients, protein becomes a non-issue. It just comes along for the ride. However, conversely, actively avoiding protein tends to have a diabolical impact on the essential vitamin and mineral content of our diet. If you're a bodybuilder trying to build lean muscle mass, you can focus on boosting the more anabolic branch chain amino acids. And if you're an endurance athlete that doesn't want to rely on pasta and energy gels to get in the energy you need, you can focus on high energy density foods while still keeping nutrient density high. You may have noticed that the micronutrient splits of these various dietary approaches vary significantly. However, what is consistently missing from these optimal food lists is sugars and processed grains that contain a pitiful amount of nutrition. A low-carb diet will largely ensure that you avoid the majority of these dangerous frankenfoods by avoiding sugars, seed oils, anti-nutrients and chemicals that are often associated with processed grains. However, what I've found though, after playing around with these food lists for a few years, is that everything seems to work out well when we start by prioritising micronutrients and then tweak from there to suit our goals. A further problem I identified with these lists is that they don't contain, they don't consider what you're currently eating, my favourite movie. Each person's interpretation of a low carb, ketogenic or paleo diet will depend, vary depending on your preferences, finances, culture, appetite and activity levels. I think what you really need to know is which foods will provide you with more of the nutrients you're not currently getting from your diet. So this year I've been developing the Nutrient Optimizer algorithm, a new tool that will help you identify what foods you should be eating more of, which foods you should be eating less of, and which new foods you should look out for next time you go shopping. Rather than ad adopting the Pete Evans diet or the Tom Brady diet for a period and then falling off the wagon, 
The Nutrient Optimizer will help you make continual incremental improvements in your journey towards optimal nutrition. The al algorithm takes into account your food log, answered in chronometer, and then analyzes it to see which nutrients you're not currently getting enough of. We also look at the critical ratios to make sure you're not prioritizing nutrients that are going to further exacerbate any current imbalances. And then we can also factor in additional nutrients that relate to your current symptoms, such as diabetes, low testosterone, fertility, or a whole range of other conditions that are associated with nutrient deficiencies. The algorithm then generates a suite of personalised food lists tailored to suit your current goals. To date, I've run the Nutrient Optimizer algorithm for about 70 different people, and it's really exciting to see the competitive types try to work their way up the leaderboard. <laughs> if you're a nutrition nerd like me, it may be interesting to go here and drill down and see what each of these people are actually eating to achieve these high and low nutrient scores. Sitting in first place at the top of the list is Dr. Rhonda Patrick, who, as you might imagine, eats uh, fairly well. But the best competition is against yourself with the incremental improvements by implementing the successive recommendations of each iteration of the Nutrient Optimizer algorithm. For example, we can see Andy Mant here has made leaps and bounds in, is in his nutrition in preparation for his recent Paris wedding. A happy ending. If you're interested, uh, the food lists that I've flashed up today are available for free over at optimizingnutrition.com. And if you want to learn more, you can check out the FAQ over at nutrientoptimizer.com. I've also got a number of Facebook groups that bear witness to my social media addiction, where you can meet all my really smart friends that I love to learn from. Thank you very much for your time and attention today.